All right, guys, it has finally arrived. 2024's Every Bit Counts Challenge. I know I have been regaling you guys with all my past videos, and you're probably tired of seeing stuff for Every Bit Counts Challenge, but believe me, I have a feeling this season is going to be a little bit different because stuff is just all out of whack. The blackberries are quite behind. The tomatoes aren't doing anything yet in the garden. I think we're looking at at least week three, maybe even week four before we really have a lot of tomato content. But I am looking forward to bringing you guys a whole bunch of different recipes and sharing what I get up to. Uh, as I mentioned in one of those recap videos, I'm hoping to keep going with all the herbs. I have big plans, which I have not fully organized yet in my mind, but I will on how much I think we're going to need. This cupboard behind me is my spice rack and uh, it's so lacking in organization. I don't actually know what I need right now, but the garden is full of things like mint and stevia and parsley and just a whole bunch of good forageable stuff as well. So we're gonna have no shortage of dehydrating content. We've also been putting a lot of stuff in the freezer. Once again, we're getting some lamb meat for week two. So we'll be canning some of that because as you can see here, very, very little space in the freezer. But looking forward to bringing out some of my favorite cookbooks, doing some August stew, some pizza sauce, some chili sauce. That's one thing that I desperately need. But uh, as you saw in our pantry tour, the pantry is still looking quite full but I think we can still fill it a bit more. And I love to store food. I love to have a lot of food because you never know what's going to happen next year in the garden. It's like my tomatoes. I don't know how much tomatoes I'm actually gonna get. So I'm really glad that last year I made a lot of tomato product. But without any further ado, we're gonna get outside and get harvesting some herbs to start filling these jars. I've already got some basil, mint, and stinging nettle started for this year. I'm behind. I'm always behind. I don't know why that is, but uh, it just is the way things go. So we're going to get busy with a lot of dehydrating and hopefully we'll see some fruit production as well because the raspberries and that are done. We're waiting on the blackberries. We still have a few blueberries coming in. So maybe we'll make something with that. But for the most part, we've been putting them in the freezer. So let's get going. So day one of Every Bit Counts Challenge is all about harvesting herbs. We're starting off with some catnip, not for us, for the cats, but it was growing rogue in the garden. So we had to get it out anyways in order to prevent it kind of choking out uh, some other plants. So that's step one, but now we're going to go harvest some stevia and basil and a few other things. So here we are in front of one of our little stevia patches. As you know from previous videos, stevia has become a staple in our kitchen for sweetening so many things like smoothies and sauces and dressings and all that sort of stuff. And it's actually not too terrible for you. The mosquitoes are bad because it's getting to dusk. So what we need to do in order to keep these plants really pumping out more sort of branches is cut off all these top bits. That way it'll bush out into a thicker bush and that'll give me a first harvest for the year of our stevia plants. The one real nice thing about herbs is the more you cut them back, usually the more they grow. So full bowl, barely any time spent and look at how much stevia is still here. And these are just gonna bush out more and more as I harvest. So we will get this drying and we'll probably come back in a week's time and harvest again. All right, so I got completely bugged out going to harvest that stevia. So we never got to the basil. Uh, that's just how it works sometimes. I know I should be tougher. But anyways, so today we're gonna go out, we're gonna harvest that basil and we're gonna get a few other things and get them into this rack behind me drying. Now, first thing we're gonna do is talk about my methods. Now, what you're seeing behind me here is kind of that free hanging drying rack. Uh, it doesn't involve any electricity. We love that. We bought it at Lee Valley. If I think about it, I will put a link down below so that you can find this yourselves. It is very, very useful for shortening the time in the electric dehydrator. Now, what we find here is in our humidity this time of year, unless we run a fan on this or something, it never dries enough to be crispy. You'll hear behind me here. That's some mint that we have in here from previous. It's been in here for maybe two, three days and it's basically gotten as dry as it's gonna go. And we need to get this cleaned out and out of the way in order to 
free up some space for that stevia and the basil and parsley that we're going to bring in here. Hopefully we'll get all those things. We'll see. There's so much stuff around to harvest. It's not even funny. So what you're seeing on the rack here, we have some bee balm or bergamot petals and leaves drying. We've got our apple mint and we've got chocolate mint. So we do a lot of mint dehydrating because we have a lot of it on the property and we love it for teas and things like that. So without any further ado, we're gonna get some of this off of the rack and into the electric dehydrator to run for a couple hours, just to crisp it up and get it ready to be stored for long-term. It pays to have a nice big bowl for doing this. All right, so we ended up with four racks of the apple mint, and I've got one tray on top with my chocolate mint. This is almost crunchy enough that I could have done it probably just as it was, but we're going to still dehydrate it out just to be sure and safe. And you can see sitting next to that there, we've got a couple kohlrabi that we picked the other day, and we're going to get the leaves off those and chop them up quickly to freeze, and then get out to the garden. So that's the one thing that's really, really nice about kohlrabi is the greens are edible as well. Kind of like a collard green, I guess you would call it. So we're going to get these chopped up and cleaned and then into the freezer. Not all of it is going to be usable. I mean, there's some that are, as you can see, a little bit sad, but there certainly will be parts that are good and we're going to get them put away because every bit does count. And these are fantastic in stir fries or things like that even uh, tossed into some pasta sauce if you cut them up small enough but basically it's kind of like spinach or anything else once it's been in the freezer it's a little bit soft it works great for a lot of things i'm not even going to flash freeze i'm just going to put them in a bag they don't stick together if you don't crunch them in too far and we do that with our kale as well so no need to worry none of this gets wasted the rabbits absolutely love the greens off of this sort of thing kale cabbage all of that even these stalks, I know that I could use them, but I'm not. They're gonna go to the rabbits, and I'm just going to take the greens, chop them into manageable pieces for cooking later, and get them washed. And now to clean up our mess, Honestly, these things are so handy. I might have to get a second one. I went years without something like this and it does everything I need it to do. It's wonderful. All right, so we are out in the jungle of a garden. It's a beautiful morning and it is time to harvest some of those herbs. So you can see here, we've got a bit of variety. We've got some lemongrass, some parsley, that stevia that you saw earlier, and a lot of weeds, of course. <laughs> in the center here, we have that bee balm that I've uh, been harvesting from. That's not our only patch, of course. But the main thing we really need to focus on today is definitely getting that basil. It's starting to go to seed and we need to pinch off those tops, same way we did with the uh, stevia to keep it becoming a bush and not going to seed and just dying off because that's what happens. But as we're standing out here in the garden, the one thing I was going to say is if anybody's interested in a garden tour on this channel, leave a comment below and let me know. I am always happy to do a garden tour. I love my garden, but we also have the Hickory Croft Farm channel, which does share a lot of that content as well. But I know not everybody follows both channels. So if you're interested in seeing some of the garden in a video, just let me know and we will do that because it is looking amazing this year. So you can see down in front there, we got a whole bowl, but really it barely even made a dent. It doesn't even look like we really did much, but we did take off all those tops that were trying to go to seed. So should have basil for a few more weeks yet to come. And now let's harvest some of this gorgeous parsley. I actually have a second bucket, which was supposed to be later parsley, but it dried out and kind of died back, but I do see it is starting to go again. So this should help come fall time. I will admit, I'm not actually sure even where to start in here. It is thick, holy cow. I probably should have been harvesting some earlier, but it's gorgeous, gorgeous and green. All right, guys, so this is a short week here. I'm maybe gonna break it up and do it two videos per week because we're kind of starting off weird, right? 
I'm basically kind of covering the first, second, third. I might throw the fourth into this video, I don't know, but we'll see how we do. But right now we are going to be doing some fermenting. I don't do a lot of fermenting. I am by no means a professional at this or anything. This is just a recipe along with my fermented salsa, which we uh, put the video on for that last week. Um, these fermented turnip pickles, pickled turnips, fermented. We're gonna go with fermented pickled turnips. Uh, are amazing and they are foolproof. They turn out so good every single time. I have tried to can these before, did not love it. So that's why we go with this method and I store them in the fridge. You can see here, we still have some from earlier this year when we finally canned up all those turnips that we had saved from last year. So now I have been harvesting our turnips over the last week or so, whenever they get to a size that I think is perfect for it or the tops start to die back, then I just go, yeah, it's time to pull you. So we finally got enough here to do probably a double batch is what I'm hoping. And uh, first thing we're going to do is get our brine ready. Cause the one thing you need to do is cool this off after you've brought it to a boil. So we need to get all of our ingredients in. It's a very, very simple recipe. It's actually a very, very quick thing to do. And I love that and no canning involved, that sort of thing. So it's a good way to start the Every Bit Counts Challenge. So we're gonna get all our ingredients in the pot and then we're going to get that to a boil and then while it's simmering and cooling off, we're going to clean our turnips, peel them and slice them up. And then we'll bring you back when we discuss putting it all together in the end. All right, so I'm starting off in my pot with six bay leaves. Turn it on. I'm going to add six cups of water. Four cups of vinegar, just plain white vinegar. You can use the pickling vinegar. I don't find there's really all that much difference. Two tablespoons of whole coriander. Two tablespoons, and I go quite heaping because we really like the fennel flavor in this, but as I just mentioned, two tablespoons of fennel and one cup of pickling salt. Now I know everybody went, ah, one cup of salt. Fermenting does involve quite a bit of salt. And to be honest, it does make it taste amazing. These aren't an item that you're eating in large quantities when you sit down to have it. We love them on lamb burgers or in sandwiches. Uh, definitely on a charcuterie board, you know, with some cheese and meats. Oh, very, very good that way. But we're going to get this to a boil. Then it needs to simmer for 10 minutes and then we're gonna turn it off because it needs to completely cool before we pour it over top of our turnips. So while that's happening, let's get busy cleaning and peeling. So I'm not gonna bore you with too much details as I go through all this prep here. Uh, basically, I have a video that goes into a lot more depth on this recipe, which I will link it above. If you want to uh, get a bit more information, I'll still include everything you need to know basically in this video as well. But for now, I've got my big bowl here to take all the peelings and the off cut ends because the rabbits will enjoy those. And then I will bring you back when our brine has cooled and I have these all cut up into matchsticks. All right, so I decided to come out and get my beets that we need to make these lovely turnips turn pink. And I thought I'll give one more look around the garden to see if there's any more turnips because I'd like to just have them done, to be honest, rather than have to make another little partial batch. And sure enough, I found a couple more. So see right there, that's turnip leaves. That was my first hint that I'd missed some in here. And I came down to have a look. In a sec, see them down in there? There's one there and one there. So we're gonna take those out of here because to be honest, this time of year, they're probably not gonna do much more. And look, there we go, wonderful. So we're gonna get those in and I'm gonna look around the other side because I see one more plant. So here you can see we've got another plant. Oh yeah, oh, it's a little one, but we're gonna take it anyways because I don't think it's gonna do much more. Not this time of year anyway. And there appears to still be one more plant. Oh, it doesn't have anything on it. We're gonna leave that one for now. I still see some through there. Oh, that's a little baby one too. We're gonna leave that one. 
But here's the part that we actually came out for. We need some beets for this recipe. So let's take a few of these beauties. There's a really nice one. Probably need at least two or three kind of that size. These are cylindrical beets. That's what we have grown this year along with Detroit Reds. Look at that one. It's huge. And there's our last one. A gorgeous Detroit Red for this one. So there we are, a little bonus harvest video. A couple more turnips we're gonna peel and get into the bucket and all the beets that we need. All right, so we are back in and I've taken the tops off the turnips and I've got them all cut up here into the rest of them. I've got a plate on top to keep them submerged into the water, all those matchsticks until we're ready to put them into the jars. But next is going to be beets. I have taken off all the leaves that were not human grade and they've gone into a bucket for the bunnies. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to take these greens and put them into the fridge for uh, eating in some stir fries and things. Beet greens keep amazing. Like if I clean them and put them into a Ziploc bag, they will keep for weeks. And uh, it's wonderful because then nothing is really being wasted, right? So now it's time to clean up these beets. In my video where I do this recipe, I cook the beets first, not cook them, but I blanch them or whatever, heat them, boil them in order to remove the skins. And this time I'm going to try and do it without removing the skins. It's just a step that makes it take a little bit longer if you do it that way. So this is an experiment. I've always done it with heating them first and taking the skins off that way so they're kind of blanched. So this time I'm going to chop the greens off, peel them, cut them into little rounds or matchsticks, I'm not sure which, and then just bung them right into the jar with everything else. I don't know if it's going to make a difference, but to be honest, we never eat the beet part anyways, usually. So we might as well give this a shot, right? Worst case scenario, it's not going to bleed as much color, but I have a feeling it will. All right, so we've got our beets cleaned up and something that's quite interesting I'm finding. So this one here is my Detroit red beet. You can see it's red, but it's not crazy red. And then these ones are the cylindrical beet. It's like a real consistent dark red. So I'm gonna save this for our smoothie today and I'm just going to use all of the uh, cylindrical beets. The idea of them is to kind of leach out their color into the water and to dye the turnips that nice purple color or, or pink color, I guess you could say. So that's next for those. We're gonna chop them up and then what we need to do now is sterilize our jars. The thing you're going to need to make these, or at least what I use is a little fermenting kit. So you put in the little glass part goes on top of everything. I'll show this as we go. And then you put the lid on top and then you screw on your little lid. So all of this needs to be sterilized because you don't want to put any contaminant into your ferment, any bad bacteria, right? So we're going to get all the glass product into the oven, 225 for 10 minutes. And then we're going to heat this, not to a boil, but to pretty warm so that those uh, plastic or rubber pieces are also sterilized. And then we will be back and we will pour it all together. It is so hot out today that my brine wasn't cooling down, but I got smart and I put it in the fridge. So we should be just about ready to go. So now we have to fill our jars. Now, other than the brine and obviously the uh, turnips, what we need in each jar is two cloves of garlic, which I actually am super duper impressed with our garlic. This is still our harvest from 2023 and it's holding amazing. I mean, they're still pretty firm in there, which I am surprised because I thought for sure they were going to be soft already. But we have to get this all made up into some garlic powder because we still have pounds and pounds of it and it's time to harvest this year's. But that's another story for another day. What we're going to do, two cloves of garlic in each jar. And then we're going to put probably four or five good sized chunks or maybe eight smaller pieces. I haven't really figured that out yet. You'll just have to watch and see. And then turnip, fill it right as full as you can get it kind of thing. Uh, you still have to leave room for the weight to push it down. And uh, yeah, then we fill it with brine, put our lid on, our fermenting cap, and it goes downstairs in the dark cooler basement for four days. Uh, so let's get started with our packing. 
it's already starting to make the uh, turnips turn color already. So I don't think it needed to be cooked to disperse that color. So now basically at this point, you've got your garlic, your beet, and your turnip. So I try to fish out at least one bay leaf to go in there. Just kind of squish it down in, just so it keeps flavoring it. You'll see in there, all of the seed and whatnot sinks to the bottom. So I have to stir that before I scoop so that I can get some of that seed in to keep flavoring these pickles as they ferment. A little closer. So just give it a stir. And then you'll see when I pour it in, I guess you won't see because there's a funnel in the way. There's a whole bunch of seed on top, which is great. And you're pretty much filling to about an inch from the top because when that weight goes in, you don't want it to uh, spill over. So there you can see we're about an inch from the top. Our weight goes in like so. Perfect fill. Our little funnel cap goes on top. And then we put our ring on. And that's the basic process. Now we're going to rinse and repeat. So I come downstairs to grab a few supplies and I thought I will just quickly show you our pickled turnips from before because it's amazing. They are still in incredible shape. Here we go. So these ones here that are a little bit different colored, these are from early 2023, about the same time as now when we're making them. And you can see, absolutely nothing wrong I could pop one out if I wanted and eat it and we've also got jars here from 2024 but this comes back to the conversation I had just like a clip of go <laughs> about the different beets these ones in 2024 were made with our cylindrical beets which are really deep red beet and these ones were made with the Detroit red beet and look at the color difference over time on both of them. I find that phenomenal and I think it's very interesting and possibly a reason we might just grow cylindrical beets. We got all of our fermented pickled turnips done and in their jars with their little tops on. We ended up with seven jars in the end. Now one thing I didn't mention when you're making this, basically one jar is about a pound of turnip. Just an FYI in case you plunge ahead with making this recipe. But we're not done yet, even though this is the end of day three for the Every Bit Counts Challenge and we're going to wrap it up here, I do have one more task that has to get finished. All right, we're getting late at night. There's tons of sound effects going on, but I'm gonna soldier on with this video because it's important. What I have in here is rabbit. Today, while I was working on those pickled turnips, I also roasted or slow cooked, I guess you could say it's kind of like pulled rabbit sort of style nine rabbits that we butchered two days ago and we need to get them into the freezer so i don't know if i've actually put the video on yet with uh, our method of cooking the rabbit if i did i will link it above but this method with the pulled rabbit is our go-to we cook it all then we separate it into meal size freezer bag containers so that all i have to do is pull it out of the freezer and it's perfect for stir fry or curry or if you want to make fajitas or anything like that so this is our real big go-to way of consuming rabbit meat here on the homestead. So I'm going to get them out of here, get all the meat off, and then I'm gonna show you what we're left with at the end because it's amazing how many meals you can get out of these guys. It's coming along, I'm going to get these bagged up and at the end of the video, I'm gonna show you just how much these nine rabbits produced for us to put into the freezer for meals. But We've gotten a great collection of meat for cats. You saw earlier when we took the cat food out of the freezer to can it up. This is basically where all that meat came from. All the little parts out of the rabbit meat and that sort of thing that we just did not want in our food. <laughs> all right, so we ended up with eight containers or eight meals for human consumption and two, which you'll see coming up here with the lids on them, which will be for cat food. All in all, amazing. So from the nine rabbits, we got eight meals put away. Each one of these containers is about a pound of meat and we got cat food. And we also have some treats for the chickens where they'll clean up those bones like it's nobody's business. But all in all, a great little tuck away at the end of this first episode of the Every Bit Counts Challenge. 
definitely stay with us as we keep going. The garden is just starting to pump for us and I think it's going to be a busy couple of weeks. Berries are coming, those blackberries as you've seen in my past videos this last little while. And I have a feeling the tomatoes are going to actually happen. There's a lot of green ones on those vines and if this heat stays, we're gonna be making tomato stuff. So stay tuned for all of that in our next episode of the Every Bit Counts Challenge for 2024. Bonus Every Bit Counts. I know I said the video was over, but I forgot about the fruit that I had picked and getting it into the freezer. So you can see here, we've already got some on the go. I didn't pick a lot, so I'm just gonna add it in here and it's still gonna get frozen. Raspberries in. And this is such a great way. See those blueberries? It works awesome to freeze them like this. And then you can just pull out what you need when you need it. So now we are officially done with this video for Every Bit Counts.